Good evening, partners in mission. Partner in the gospel. Our convention theme is sourced in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And it is my privilege this opening evening to give attention to the initial five verses. Paul and Timothy, servants, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So, about a month ago, I get a letter in the mail, uh, old style, you know, USPS, from my brother. I have one sole sibling. My older brother, Mark, solid guy. He is three years and eight months older than me. All through life, ever, Mark is the inch taller, the step faster, and frankly, he's got better hair. Mark's a stand-up guy. He's supposedly a retired farmer, though I don't see it. He's been on the county fair board for centuries, literally centuries. He's a county commissioner a couple hours north of here, Clearwater County. Good, upright, hardworking, honest man. Some people think we look alike, but I'm not so sure that he quite measures up to this. I, I don't know. It's just my humble opinion. And while not altogether humorless, Mark's a bit more, shall we say, on the stoic or stayed side of the family. So, when the envelope from my brother comes with no other identifier from him other than inside is another envelope. And I'm thinking, farm, bill, check, something, you know, just some terse kind of typical Mark kind of thing, but instead the little envelope on the inside of his envelope has our mother's handwriting on it, I come to find from some 55 years before, my interest is piqued. So is yours. Here, by the way, for context, is the, uh, in Clearbrook, Minnesota, the Elam Lutheran Brethren Church Directory Family Larson Photo, circa 1969. Yeah. I know, stellar haircut. Yeah, while noticing, please don't miss the detail that while three grades ahead of me, I had already caught my brother in Sunday School Perfect Attendance Awards. Just note, note that, please, from the little medallion there, just pointing that out. Anyway, back to the envelope. My mom had written on the envelope only my name, Paul, apparently to both impugn and to preserve the contents inside forever, therein, that envelope, a letter, a note, my note, my six-year-old note, nay, a declaration of independence, a protest note from me of injurious harm, plain raw truth from a six-year-old. Now, I, I don't truly recall the incident, but I guess six-year-old me had had a spat with 10-year-old brother, Obviously, already, we know an unfairly weighted contest from the start. And apparently, following said spat, maternal referee steps in, separates us to our corners, and apparently the particular gravity of this bout must have been so dark and hard it required something I actually truly have no memory of ever otherwise happening, and that was I was sent to my room. And there, in my room, like my namesake, the Apostle Paul, from prison, <laughs> I penned the painful but unavoidable truth. My six-year-old 
Concord's solid declaration, my here I stand, I can do no other, say no other moment. So the note, and by the, you know, some things never change between siblings. So that note that my now 65-year-older counter-commissioner brother somewhere somehow finds, digs up about his now 61-year-old kid brother synodical president, doesn't matter, some things never change. I don't know, he finds it in our departed mother's boxes of keepsake, or perhaps Mark has just been sitting on this for decades. <laughs> and for whatever reason decides his powder's been kept dry long enough, and, and maybe before I go off and die prematurely, ruining his moment, he decides now, five and a half decades later, it's the time to drop this on me. And this evening, you are the benefitees. Here's the note by six-year-old me. Have I built this up enough? Are you ready uh, to see the note? Here it is. 1969. I hate mom. I got hurt. I hate Mark. I am Paul. That's it. No, no note for my brother or anything. Just that. First of all, BC24, may I just say, you're welcome. Okay, you're welcome. Second, might I point out that my penmanship as a six-year-old was actually better than it is now at 61. And third, my ability to communicate in brevity is just stunningly alarming for all of you, I know. Now, on the backside of these... Wittenberg six-year-old theses, mom documented the story for posterity. Thank goodness. Next slide. May 17th, 1969, Paul and Mark were fighting. Mark teasing and Paul squealing as usual. Squealing, mom, really? As usual? That's so subjective and rather unnecessary, don't you think? That's yeah, superfluous detail. I finally made Paul go to the bedroom just to separate the two. While he was in the bedroom, he wrote this. Afterwards, Paul, Mark took Paul upstairs and had him cross out hate and put love. <laughs> Not about himself, by the way, but about, this is my comment now, but about mom. If you flip back to the last slide, just I, I go back. Notice above I hate mom in light blue you know, I found a colored pencil. The, it, love is, is there. Apparently, my brother made me do that for mom, not him. Back to mom's explanation. But Paul said, I still don't like you because you wouldn't listen to me and I was hurt. Well, that's totally understandable, don't you think? The point. I stand here 55 years later. And I'm so blessed and pleased to tell you of my mother and my brother Mark. They got better. <laughs> they improved. My brother and mother over time, of course, with much remedial instruction by myself, exhortation and occasional chastisement, improved. For such hateful and miserable persons, both Mark and mother, to my great surprise and the betterment of the world in the passing of years made significant strides in both behavior and character. Oh, such a sinful, sorry boy I was and am. By the way, I'm very certain I was duly disciplined for the above. Again, to the point. I miss mom. Eight and a half years now she's been home. Grief still triggered by a picture or a hymn, a memory, a wish for a phone call, for wise counsel her well-worn, studied insight of Scripture, the safe deposit box with matters that you kind of still always your whole life tell a mom. And my brother, Mark, really is a good guy. He's my favorite brother, my only brother. He's a good friend who seasonally weeds out of me any wild, involuntary hope that our Vikings, twins, or wolves will actually yield anything other than sure disappointment. 
yeah, they got better. We got better. The scripture text before us that welcomes us into our BC 24 convention holds out an implicit hope and promise to the church, to the CLB, to you and the people around you that in Christ, in our partnership, in our relationships, we can be made better. Not meritoriously, certainly, but in our partnered fellowship, that which glues us together in resilient community and shared purpose, we all partnered in faith and mission, Christ can make us better together. And he does. The koinonia of the hagios, the fellowship of the saints, partnership, translated partnership here, this that means, this word, koinonia, the sharing of something held Dearly close in common. May I repeat that? And do you know what that is for us? The sharing of something held dearly close in common. The apostle loves the word koinonia. Two-thirds of its nearly 20 appearances in the New Testament come from Paul's pen, his heart, his experience. And what is that which so better binds us together as partners, as family, as church? What is it that moves us past, or at least through all the hurts, all the hates, all the histories with ourselves and others. It is, in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I love how the Apostle Paul here in this letter's first couple verse salutation expresses values revels in the partnered relationships he has with the church paul is so predictably and i might add gloriously apt to do this in virtually every one of his letters in his epistles salutations and valedictions do you notice paul takes time he takes you got the greatest doctrinal letter arguably galatians or romans the 16th chapter of Romans is fully given over to this. You love how Paul takes this time and effort again and again at the salutation and the valediction to perpetually start and end his letters greeting, bonding, thanking, boasting of his mission partners. Except the letter to Galatia. There he just kind of gets right after business. But all elsewhere, how rhythmically Paul, and think of it, this nomad, this itinerant apostle preacher, this pioneering entrepreneur, this solitary maverick rogue, here I stand, I can do nor speak no other, regardless what you think of me, regardless of what prison you throw me in, what shipwreck, what buried under a pile of cast stones, regardless of what hot-headed teammate, contentious Isolation Paul experiences and even at times brings upon himself. Nevertheless, this guy says, because of your partnership. Because of your partnership in the gospel. Paul sees past all that. And embraces all these. Because of the gospel of Jesus. Do you suppose if the Apostle Paul, that guy, sought, needed, and valued such partnership that we somehow need it less? Paul and Timothy, themselves partners in the gospel, servants, slaves of Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, Maybe we'd expect more something like St. Paul to all you underlings in Philippi. But instead we get Paul and Timothy together with, again, partners, the overseers and deacons, pastors, elders, with deacons, those who minister by serving. Again, partners in ministry. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knows this and we perceive in this first couple verse salutation that gospel partnership is God's gift is God's gift to us. 
And in that, maybe, just maybe, perhaps in Christ, we can be better. In Christ, we may be brought past hates and harms and hurts and histories. This gift is a partnership God seeks to give, even in our frenzied, fragmented, isolating world, even in the hyper-individualistic, Western, proud, insecure, competitive, opinionated, divisive, consumerist world in which we live that frankly too often is sadly mirrored in the hyper-individualistic, proud, insecure, competitive, opinionated, divisive, and consumerist church. In the power of the gospel, maybe we, young and old, male and female, pastor to pastor, congregation to congregation, department of the CLB to department, synod with region and congregation, and you with me, just maybe we in Christ and his gospel may be formed better than we've been. Now moving to verses 3 and 4, we see further in Paul not only this gift from God, but this cultivated pattern of gospel partnership. There is this plain, intentional pattern just etched over Paul's life. It's a pattern, it reminds me of looking at a freshly mowed Major League Baseball outfield, you know? Just all the lines perfect. It's like a Rognus cornfield. I, I don't know what else image to, to, an elaborately designed quilt. Gospel partnership is not only God's gift to us, Gospel partnership is our response of faith in a cultivated pattern. Paul's words here are really quite extraordinary. Just pause. And you have heard this so many times, but just pause and absorb them. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I thank, thankfulness, my God, every time I remember, remembrance, you. God show, Paul shows here this cultivated pattern of grateful remembrance that surely does not come readily nor haphazardly. When I read these lines, something stirs in me, kind of like this. Wow, look at Paul. Oh, to be like Paul. This constancy of gratitude for others. This continual favorable remembrance keeping brothers and sisters constantly in mind and heart and prayer. And I want you to know, Church of the Lutheran Brethren people, if but for these bright lights, as I just could look out at you, I want you to know that I really want to say this about you. that I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Speaking to our missionaries, some present with us this evening, we're so glad at our LBIM Global Missionary Retreat in Thailand in November, I was actually allowed, invited uh, to speak on Philippians chapter 3. And I pointed out in there that Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. Rejoice being both God's imperative and an enabled promise to us. And similarly, in the next chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. There is this thing in Paul about remembrance and repetition. My comment to our missionaries was that at the heart of joy, which was our theme, as at the heart of communion, the Lord's Supper, is this very intentional pattern, cultivated remembrance, a willful participation by the enablement of the Spirit to rehearse who Christ is, what he's done, and how he lives in me and you. And as I said then, I say to you, I, I said, and so forgetfulness, spiritual forgetfulness is really the enemy of joy and the near cousin of unbelief. Tonight, I believe we may inversely say here that remembrance is the friend of partnership. And just not merely the remembrance of good times that we had back then and we laughed, but the remembrance 
of why it is and what it is and how it is and who it is that bonds us together in the gospel. Friends, we are not to give way to lifetimes of perpetual inner ruminating rehearsal of harms done to us by others, especially in the church. We are not to give way to a perpetual rehearsal of what's wrong in you or wrong in me. But by the call of the word in following Jesus, the Spirit of God makes us better to remember, rehearse, rinse, repeat what by Christ, in Christ, is right in you, in me, and in us. By the way, just an aside here. While surely our weakness is perfected in Christ's strength, absolutely we cannot contribute the smallest iota to our salvation. We're helpless to gain it at all. Yet a full reading of Scripture knows not of a living faith in a spirit-indwelled new man, new woman, who does not yield in a response of faith, unmeritoriously, of course, but who does not yield in a response of faith with the sanctifying work of God that he is doing in and summoning from the believer. And whether that be remembrance or joy or prayer or gratitude or partnership or faithfulness or witness or fidelity, or any obedience in the following of Christ, may I say to us that weakness is not the same as listlessness, and a clinging to the cross is not the same as the embrace of failure. Christ gives and works in us that which he calls and requires. So when Paul gratefully remembers the believers in Philippi, you know, he could, he could remember that when he came to Philippi, actually, not a single guy, not a single man showed interest in his message. Only women, I shouldn't say only, but it was only women like Lydia and others at the river seemed interested at the beginning of his ministry. He could dwell on that. He could remember that nails on the chalkboard howling after him by that demon-enabled, soothsaying slave girl in Philippi, who he really hoped that after being liberated and also hopefully converted, became one of those partners in the gospel that he's talking about here. He could sooner remember the beating and scourging by the soldiers and the jeers of the crowd and magistrates, some of whom very likely later sheepishly joined the church. And then not sheepishly, but joyfully became Paul's partners in mission. The iron clamps that the jailer bonded onto Paul's wrists in that slimy, damp, and infected cell, Paul could remember more than that same jailer later washing his wounds and imploring Paul to baptize him and his family. But that's not, but that's not what and how Paul remembers. Paul says also here of these partners in mission, I thank my God in every remembrance of you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy. Paul somehow has this cultivated pattern of grateful remembrance and of joyful prayer. And did you hear, by the way, as I've read these verses now several times, I don't know what to say other than they are like the absolute royal flush of absolutes. This is not my notes, but this for me, of, of being kind of a technical person, is like my wife's family who are a family, uh, they're the superlative uh, a family. And, and while for me there is best and worst, for them there are many bests and many worsts. And as a matter of fact, if you ask my wife who her best friend is, she'll tell you five or six names. I'm still on the list, aren't I? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm still in there. But when that aside, this is kind of my response to hearing to Paul, this, this royal flush of absolutes. I thank my God, not when or if, but every time I remember you. Not in some 
but in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. And all God's children said, really? You know, try this on for size. This can be very uncomfortable for this room, because I know you. Uh, just turn to the person sitting next to you right now. and Please, do. And, and just don't turn. I mean, really turn and look them square in the eye, whether friend or pastor or spouse or the guy from Bismarck you just met earlier today. Virtual stranger, but you can read her name tag. Whatever, just do it. Just turn, and I want you to not break eye contact. And are you ready? Just say this. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy. Anyone here just feel like right now you're doing the bad dad joke, don't laugh challenge? That's hard, right? Am I the only skeptical person here? In vulnerable honesty, can I admit, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not so sure that I can be better. I don't know about you, but when I really listen to Paul in verses 3 and 4, I'm not sure if what rings in my head is that choral piece, I thank my God, you know, we sing it at Hillcrest graduations, or if it's more that Paul here kind of sounds like that progressive commercial mom with her selfie stick and Stanley Tumblr social influencing out by the mountain lake, hey fam, I'm at this beautiful lake practicing gratitude, manifesting abundance in all my prayers for all of you. I, I always, that, that's kind of what it sounds like to me. I read this line and something stirs in me doubtful that something is off in me like sushi bought at a convenience store. I mean, was Paul such an extraordinarily godly spiritual giant that he could just look past the major faults and fault lines of the church corporate no less the peevish tendencies of individuals like spatting Eodia and Syntica in chapter 4. You know, all their relatives were really like that. That's just who they were. Did Paul not ever have to sit through a trustee board meeting during tough times? Did he never hear about the parishioner who incredibly possessed the spiritual gift of perfect discernment regarding the correct volume of music? Did Paul ever venture into youth ministry or deal with their parents? Did Paul never hear at the door greeting people on the way out of the sanctuary about how spectacular the sermon was by Apollos? Did he never get the anonymous non-prayer prayer card in the offering plate? Or be passively bullied by that formless impossible to respond to? You know, some people are upset. And was it that actually EOD and Syntyche were the remote, remote rare exception and all the other believers in Philippi, every other one were these sap, sweet, beautiful, pure, lovely, and lovable saints. And not to mention that, do we truly buy that the Apostle Paul was such a completely transformed man with no remaining traces of his pre-enlightened, deadly, tempestuous Saul that now he only brimmed with affection for the saints and had this fortuitously selective memory that made him just look past all hates, hurts, and histories. I think not. And remember, I am Paul. <laughs> Let me bring this toward the close. Yet this is what Paul in inspired scripture says. Gospel partnership is God's gift. Gospel partnership is our response of faith in a cultivated pattern. So just how? So just how may our partnership in mission be strengthened? How may those isolating hurts and hates and histories for us be reconciled and God's people restored to each other? Just how may we be made better? Our text lands on that phrase in verse 5, because of your partnership. And I'm glad that it does not say with, but in the gospel. 
You see, God calls his church, what he calls his church into is not mere casual, friendly partnerships, certainly not a business partnership. It's not even a, a, a partnership for personal convenience or comfort or desire. What God calls the follower of Jesus into, decidedly, is a gospel partnership. In the gospel, this means that the gospel of Jesus is not only the context or the environment of our relationships. As one scholar put it, the gospel is the goal of our fellowship as well. Our partnered fellowship was conceived by this gospel. And they who are thus created by it also spread its seeds. So look around you, people, really do. You don't have to look them in the eye. Just look over the room. Had it not been for God's word and work of the gospel, they wouldn't be here you wouldn't be here. You may likely have never met any of these others around you except by the partnering work of the gospel. The bond of believers in this room, in your congregation, in the church of the Lutheran brethren, is not that we are more pleasant than average people. The blessed tie that binds us is the gospel of Christ. And it is this gospel that also unites us in our mission. It is because God sent his son, Jesus, for and to and eventually in you by his gospel, by his finished work on the cross and that we are in Christ united with him, we may be united with each other. For my last point is that gospel partnership is truly partnership with God himself in Christ. My friends, may we see that our partnership problem is never fully at the source with whomever other person we think it is. The isolation we feel or crave is never truly sourced solely in the hurt, hate, or history we have with another human being. The proud and insecure, comparing and competitive, cautious and critical feelings and words we hold or are held against us, quite honestly, never the core root of that is our distance issues with other human beings. Our guarded aversions to entrust ourselves to others, again, never fully the problem. No, here in Philippians 1, this spectacle and celebration of partnership is signal bellwether that should we find ourselves strained or estranged, distant in partnership with others, is a signal for us to consider that we better look and find whether we be estranged in partnership with God. And with the psalmist say against you. And you only have I sinned. People hear me. Your issue is never only your pastor. Or your elder. Or your colleague or your ministry teammate or your congregation. Or your friend or even your spouse. It is that your broken partnership with such broken people has not yet been swallowed up in the broken body of the now resurrected and restored Savior who has bound broken you to himself and your neighbor and made you whole. Perhaps today, even now, that is something to be confessed. and forgiveness to be received. In preparation for this convention theme, I revisited the classic short work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together, written while running an underground, talk about distance ed, seminary uh, in Nazi Germany, about how we live together in the church when there's such force for our being splintered apart, such rich passages on that little book, so many topics of koinonia, prayer, worship, reading of scripture, confession. Highly recommend the book for yourself, your church group, a book, group a book study. For example, in the opening chapter on community, Bonhoeffer says, the prisoner, the sick person, the Christian in exile, sees in the companionship of a fellow Christian a physical sign of the gracious presence of the triune God, visitor and visited in loneliness, recognize each other, the Christ who is present in the body. They receive and meet each other as one meets the Lord. Isn't that great? But it's a later section of the book called The Secret of the Psalter that really catches the eye as we consider this beckoning of Philippians 1 for us to be partnered in the gospel. And Paul's almost unfathomable, unrepeatable words 
for his absolute heart prayer thankfulness for all people, all believers at Philippi. In this passage, Bonhoeffer makes the case that the Psalms are really Christ's prayer book and that Christ only is fully fit and able to pray them. And that only as the body of Christ, in participation with Christ, may we rightly pray the Psalms. He says, The man, Christ Jesus, to whom no affliction, no ill, no suffering is alien, and who yet was wholly innocent and righteous, is praying in the Psalter through the mouth of the church. And then Bonhoeffer points out in particular how so often there is this antiphonal form This antiphonal sound in so many of the psalms, sometimes referred to as parallelism. But Bonhoeffer's point is that something greater than mere parallelism is at work here. Just one example in Psalm 5, verse 3, it reads, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. It's the first line, first voice. And then there is this second echo. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. It's of this antiphonal structure in the Psalms Bonhoeffer gives such glorious insight. He writes, it's as if there are two voices bringing the same concern to God. It's as if there are two voices. bringing the same concern to God. Bonhoeffer continues, is this not a hint that one who prays never prays alone? Always there must be a second person, another, a member of the fellowship, The body of Christ, indeed Jesus Christ himself, praying with him in order that the prayer of the individual may be true prayer. Oh, my CLB partners in mission, pause here just a moment and glory. For here is the center of our partnership in the gospel. Because gospel partnership is partnership with God himself in Christ. Here is why Paul can say what he says. Because what Paul remembers of the Philippians is what Christ remembers of the Philippians. Paul is grateful for them just as Christ is grateful for them. Paul prays for them the prayer Christ prays for them. And Paul takes joy in them just as Christ by his righteousness imputed to them takes joy, all joy, in you, in them. Yes, my friends, our partnership is and is only because of the gospel. And so even just in your mind, not you don't have to do this, but think of, look at each other again, just look around you in your heart. It is with Christ, by Christ, seeing each other through Christ. It is believing his gospel for me and for you that we can speak the words of Jesus and be made better, that our hurts and hates and histories may be healed. So in unison with Christ's voice, now we may look and say, with the apostle. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now.